So one day I'm ordering drywall. So I called up our supplier and I said, hey, I need some eight foot drywall and I need some 10 foot drywall. The lady on the phone goes, well, what do you really need? I said, what do you mean? She says, well, we have some nine foot, four inch drywall. I went and checked on deck two and three. All the exhibits are the same height. And guess what height they are? No way. Nine foot, four inches. <laughs> that was so that was cool. cool. Hey, and welcome to Zero Compromise, helping you stand for truth in a world that falls for lies. I'm Patricia Anger. Joy and we're back at Patriots Landing with Jessica D. Ford, aka JJ. Hello. And Baby D. Ford. And Rocket Rob Webb. Hey guys. And what's going on today, JJ? We are continuing the conversation with Colonel Patrick Kamuski, and we're really looking forward to, the, to today's conversation as well. Yep. So thanks guys for tuning in with us again. Part two, because Colonel K is so awesome, we had to have him on for a second part. Continue the conversation to make sure you guys continue to stay tuned throughout this whole conversation as well. Uh, also, like, subscribe, and share this video so we can get this message out to as many people as possible. So, Colonel Okay. In the last episode, we talked a little bit about your testimony, some of your background, and also uh, your involvement with building the ARC. So, and you also have a new uh, Discover program that talks a little bit about the ARC. So let's go ahead and dive into that. Right. That's being built right now. There's a couple of different titles for this. The first one we came up with is the Biblical Noah's Ark versus the Ark Encounter, or is the Ark Encounter biblical? And I kind of like that with a question mark. Is the Ark Encounter biblical? Yeah. Several yeah. others do, too. Is it yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, it's going to answer, the, the class is going to answer, the, the workshop is going to answer really two questions. Why did you build this in the first place, AIG? Why did you build this in the first place? And then why does it look like it does? Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of background about that. I'm going to be talking to... Uh, <clears throat> Tim Lovett, who was the original designer, he's an Australian guy, really, really bright young man who, who helped us with the design of the art. Why does it look like it does? And how does that relate? One of the main things uh, to talk about is how does it relate to the other Noah Ark uh, flood legend type stories that are all throughout the world? And they're everywhere throughout the world. And how does that relate? Why does this design, why is this the one that he probably built? Yeah. Noah. In last episode, you touched on briefly of your involvement with the ARC. Can you just summarize that again quickly if people didn't listen to that previous episode? Right. Um, I came up in January of 2016 uh, to help build the ARC. Uh, they put me in charge of the interior walls uh, that had to be built. I had to hire a crew and buy the materials and, and all that. Really interesting. I worked a lot with Harrison Craig and uh, Leroy LaMontagne on that, that job, which was just totally cool. Lots of great stories about what was going on with the building of the ark. Yeah, so what were some of those God stories with the building of the ark? Really very cool stuff. The Amish were there once the wood arrived, and the wood was a little bit late, which is, it was kind of a nervous thing for everyone. Obviously, uh, we were on a timeline because Ken established that 7 July timeline, 7-7, seven, seven, uh, <laughs> related to Genesis 7-7 seven, seven, when Noah entered the ark. So we had the enter the ark on the same date. Uh, but that was, that was all good. Uh, the wood was a little bit late. So once... Once that was here, there was a hundred Amish gentlemen uh, from mainly northern Indiana, some from northern Ohio and other places. They were here for a whole year building the ark, doing the timber framing. It's the largest timber frame structure in the world. They had been involved with the largest timber frame structure before that, which was a mall in northern, northern Indiana. Uh, the malls, I think, uh, not even occupied anymore. I'm not sure about that, but this place certainly is. The Ark, I keep pointing this way because the Ark is <laughs> down the road this way. So largest timber frame structure in the world, but then they needed somebody to build the walls so they can install the exhibits because behind them, all the walls is foam, the skin of the ship and all that, and it had to be finished. So just here's a story that is very cool. So one day I'm ordering drywall. We had to order a lot of pieces of drywall because several of the exhibits, especially on deck three, and then are these museum quality uh, exhibits, including all of the exhibits where the uh, Museum of the Bible has their exhibits. So it's all drywall back there. Uh, so I called up our supplier and I said, hey, I need some eight foot drywall and I need some 10 foot drywall. Cause you can get, uh, drywall has to be four feet wide, but it can be almost any length at, depending on what you're building. Uh, several big box stores around here sell eight, 10, 12 foot drywall. So I said, I need some eight and I need some 10. Well, the lady on the phone goes, well, what do you really need? <laughs> okay. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, we have some nine foot, four inch drywall. I'm like, why <laughs> do you have that? She goes, there was a, a builder who ordered 700 sheets of nine foot, four inch drywall. I said, well, let me call you back. So I 
I didn't really do that. But, <laughs> um, I went and checked. Our exhibits are the same height on deck two and deck three. Deck one, there's not really those kind of exhibits like you see on deck two and three, but on deck two and three, all the exhibits are the same height. And guess what height they are? No way. Nine foot four inches. <laughs> wow. so I was cool. totally blown away. I called her back and I said, I'll take, they had 700 sheets. I didn't take all of it, but we used a lot of that. And what's great about that is when you install it, it was at the right height, so we didn't have to score it and yeah. make a big mess and try to refinish it and stuff. So wow. that that's one of those stories. That's so powerful cool. guy we serve at Sun Hill. No kidding. In the details, like right down to the length of drywall, yeah, who would have guessed? That's so cool. Just amazing how it all came together. Absolutely. Are, were there any other of those like stories that you wanted to share with the building, or we can move um, on to that? We had, every Tuesday morning, we would have a safety huddle, uh, if you will, and it was right you know where the queue line is underneath the arc? Yes, kind yeah, where people area. are going into the arc, yeah. Mm -hmm. Underneath the arc was built 15 feet off the ground. So that area, before all the railings and everything went in, we would have a safety meeting every Tuesday morning, and the safety, the guy in charge of our uh, safety program would come in. Um, it was part of OSHA. It was an OSHA requirement. So he would give a little talk about something, and then we would actually share the gospel. That's incredible. Uh, Praise God. With all those, uh, the Amish Plus all, you know, you're talking carpenters, you're talking pipe fitters for all the uh, fire suppression, plumbers, electricians, any kind of worker that you can imagine that would have to be part of a building. We had all those guys there, into hundreds of people, and they would come to the safety meeting and they'd, they'd hear the gospel. And then at one point, Tim Chafee, it's a kind of a funny story between us. I won't get into that necessarily, but Tim went around and he was putting these placards on all where the exhibits were going to be all these things. I'm like, Tim, what are you doing? He goes, we want to show these workers what's going to happen when it's all installed. So that was a really big, it, it turned into a kind of an outreach with the workers, which well, is very cool. Yeah, that is super cool. Mm -hmm. did, did you see any conversions from that from any of the workers? No, not, sir, not necessarily, but several would come up afterwards in the meetings and ask questions. That's, oh, that's cool. cool. Yeah. Were there a lot of believers in general that were helping out with the project? Um, experience there were some. Uh, not necessarily the, the contractor type workers, but we got a lot of volunteers. We got volunteers from all over the United States coming here. Electricians, plumbers, carpenters. Uh, we had a, a high school uh, wood shop group, a bunch of boys come in and they built some of the walls on New York. Really, cool. uh, really very neat what was happening. Um, there's a couple of houses that are across the street from the arc entrance up on the hill. They're not really used anymore. But those houses were converted into, uh, we, we had 28 beds for volunteers. Mm -hmm. We built bunk beds in there and like 28 beds. And sometimes it was full. Yeah, so going back to the Ark Encounter, I mean, when you first show up, I mean, just the immense size of it is just mind blowing. I remember the first time I walked up, it just, you know, you read about it, you read about the, the dimensions of scripture, but once you actually see it in person, it's just, it really just blows you away. So talk a little bit about what's so unique about the dimensions of the Ark. <laughs> That's... Uh, that's God's God's a mathematician, mm -hmm. right? He's an engineer. Just look at the way he engineered you and I and all his creation. Mm -hmm. And and uh, engineers use math, so God's the like the ultimate mathematician. He's got a big brain. I just really think he's got this huge brain that and he breathes things into existence. But I think there there there's a design aspect of what he what he makes as well. So the arc dimensions, as you know, uh, three hundred cubits long. 30 cubits high 80, or 50 cubits wide, that equates to 510 feet long, 51 feet high, 84 feet wide. Time real quick, what, what is a cubit? For a, oh, a cubit, what we used, and there's several cubits, there's like uh, probably a half dozen different kinds of cubits, but what we used is what's called a Hebrew long cubit. It's about 20.4 inches, and that was typically the, the measurement from the elbow to uh, the tip of the finger for a dignitary or, or a king or someone like that. But we used the Hebrew group, long, long cubit, 20.4 inches. So what that equates to is a vessel that is 510 feet long, 51 feet high, 84 feet wide. And those dimensions, uh, if, you, if you know anything about nautical engineering, are perfect. Perfect dimensions for seaworthiness, weight distribution, you know, comfort, all, all kinds of different things. And, and you think of the arc, you really have to think of it as really, it's a lifeboat, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Now, I don't think it's a ship necessarily, because if you look at the definition of ship, it says a seagoing vessel under propulsion. But it is a lifeboat, 
Uh, it's got three keels, and, and Tim Lovett, the designer, again, very meticulous on what those keels look like. Why are there three keels? Why is it a flat bottom boat? Why is there a stationary rudder on the back of the arc? You know, it's for the bowl stability. Why is there a protrusion on the bow of the arc? I call that a sail, but it's really, it helps the ship steer with the wind, kind of like a feather on an arrow. So when the wind is blowing, the, the ship is going with the wind as far as steering goes, uh, because at high seas, waves are created by a wit, and not the shoreline, there's no shoreline in, in the high seas. So uh, you want that ship to go with the waves, not counter to the waves, something like that. So a lot of really great engineering design in the way that the reason why the arc looked look like it does. And we also think, why that kind of design would have survived any other kind of legendary type arc that might be in the world. Yeah, so if you guys want to learn more about that, jump onto our website. We have a ton more information on that. Also check out our answer series, books one through four. Uh, we also have a book called Flood of Evidence. Talks a lot more about that in detail. So speaking of mathematics, speaking of engineering, so within those dimensions, there's this thing called a golden ratio. So there's uh, one of the other Discover programs that you also uh, teach at the Creation Museum. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. It's one of the workshops. Uh, it's called the golden ratio. Uh, again, God's a mathematician, right? So the way we are designed, uh, Patricia, if you put your hand out. Right. So Patricia's little finger, the size of that to the size of her hand is that ratio, 1 to 1.618. So in other words, one to 1.618, everybody has the same dimensions. So my fingers are longer than yours, but the dimension is what we're looking at here. We all have the same dimensions. The re the, the size between, or the length between your nose and uh, your chin and your nose and your top of your head, it's the same dimension for every person. Right, and this is like a real design feature, right? You see this in a lot of like natural patterns and it has mm -hmm. a very aesthetic quality to it. So can you speak a little bit more to that, how it shows God's uh, right. hand and fingerprints? Well, I mean, the fingerprint, it, that's a great way to put it. It's God's design fingerprint. It's actually in our heartbeat. Mm -hmm. It's in our DNA. So we're made of these numbers. In other words, that main electric pulse coming out of your ventricle to the echo pulse to the next major pulse is 1 to 1.618. Wow. That's how cool. So the ratio is in our heartbeat. Yeah. It's in our DNA. It's in the DNA helix. So since those numbers are in us, we actually make things using these ratios, using these numbers as well. It's aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, it's literally everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. even like in sales logos, you see like in some of the uh, all the logos. of Nike and all the different logos you're familiar with because it's so uh, nice to look at, I guess you could say. Yeah. It's, in, it's in flags. Yeah. yeah. Because a, an aesthetic looking flag that's flying has the ratio. A three by five is typically the flag in the flag at your house. Mm -hmm. So that's, that ratio is roughly equivalent to uh, 1.618. It's one, actually 1.67, which is pit bus to run on. Yeah, so for all the math nerds like me, maybe that's uh, watching, for example, talk a little bit about the background and the history. Where does that golden ratio number come from? Um, the, the number, it, not necessarily the number, but the concept and the writ and the, the look was actually thought about way back when, BC time frame, long time ago. Euclid, he's the father of geometry. Uh, folks like that, uh, Phidias. The golden ratio is actually phi. It's not pi. So phi, uh, Phidias starts with PHI. So a lot of it is related to his name. Phidias is actually the architect of the Parthenon, mm -hmm. which is in uh, Athens, Greece. So Fibonacci came along in the 1200s and Fibonacci sequence, he wrote about that in a book. And you get to the golden ratio through the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci didn't relate it too well, uh, we think, to this number, this 1.618. And actually the guys, ancient times, didn't really know what the number was, but they knew it was something. And then a guy named Leonardo da Vinci came along. And Leonardo, as you know, is a great painter, sculptor, uh, inventor, and uh, he he really started drawing figures using the ratio, the golden ratio angle, uh, the golden angle is what we call, uh, and then he, he started relating that to the human body and the uh, ratios of length and, and things like that. And then taking it further, all the way up to the 1900s, of a gentleman named Mark Barr who wrote a book, and he called it Phi, mm -hmm. and established the number. So just out of curiosity, then, if you see these all throughout nature and throughout our bodies and in our heartbeats and our DNA, like, is there a reason that evolutionists might posit for why that would happen? Like, is it the most efficient for energy flow or something? Just like, what did they come luck. up with that? Yeah. yeah. 
Is well, that an explanation? They, well, they really, they don't equate it to God's design. A actually, every artist that I've talked to, the ones that we have here at the Answers, um, Answers in Genesis, the Design Center, they all get this in school. Designers get it, engineers get it, not necessarily related to God's design. That's the, that's the roadblock right there. But they all understand, I mean, if you, if you count the petals on a petal flower, you're going to get a Fibonacci number. And it, it's, it's scientific. Nobody disputes it, but they don't relate that to a divine creator. Uh, actually, Leonardo da Vinci called it the divine ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, even, even a lot of uh, secular or atheists that are out there, I mean, they recognize the so-called divine behind it. And they don't really truly have an answer for it from that secular worldview. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than just maybe just the dumb luck is what they say, right? But, right. Um, well, it's they, in the art. As a matter of fact, hey. if you take the dimensions of the height to the width of the arc, exactly. yeah. that's uh, very, very close. close to the golden ratio. It's in the Ark of the Covenant, 1.5 cubits by 2.5 cubits. That's a, that's a 5 to 3 ratio, which right. is very close to Fibonacci. Right. Uh, gold ratio. Which yeah. are all dimensions that God specified in his yes, word. In and his word. Same God who came up with the, what was it, nine nine foot four inch drywall. <laughs> he's in all the dimensions. Exactly yeah, you can right. see all he has any work on display with all of it. And also, um, the uh, golden ratio is on our YouTube channel. So if you yes. would like to go and watch it for yourself at home, you can do that and see it and the incredible handiwork that is in God's design with it. You interact with guests a lot for this presentation. <laughs> Do you have any fun stories or any story you'd like to share about your interactions with the guests through this workshop? The guests, um, I get different reactions, so, not, ne never negative reactions. Always like, why don't I know about this? How come I haven't been taught this? And my answer to that a lot of times is um, they, they don't really want to deal with it in public schools necessarily because they, had, they would have to say it's God's design yeah. and they really can't go there. But a lot of people do hear about this. Uh, a lot of homeschoolers hear about it. Just the look on some people's faces when this is going on during their class is just classic. How are they usually with all the math? Are they pretty excited about Yeah, that? sometimes the <laughs> eyes roll in back of the head. But I, I do want to get into the math because, I mean, we talk about the quadratic equation, the quadratic formula. We get into the math and show exactly that God is a mathematician because you really want to get into the brain of God and to see how technical and, and uh, what kind of an awesome engineer he is. Right. And I've heard that there wouldn't even be a foundation for math to work apart from some sort of self-existent mm -hmm. creator. Is that something you can speak to as well? It, it, it has to be a creator. I mean, Romans 120, what did Romans 120 say? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. for the invisible things of God from the creation of the world. The invisible things. I mean, if you look at God, we cannot create, we cannot recreate as humans God's nature. We can't do it. We try to do it in paintings. Some of it looks okay, but we can't recreate that beauty. The colors that are in the rainbow, the colors that are at our sunset, we can't recreate it. There has to be a divine creator. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think one of my favorite things from um, that presentation you have on YouTube um, that I recently watched is just talking about, I think it was the sunflower seeds and just mm -hmm. uh, there was like some kind of fire matrix uh, mm -hmm. simulator that you had. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing that if you just change that number, even by like a thousandth, right? Yes. Um, it doesn't work. And it just it shows work. just the precision of God's mind. God is so mind. precise with that number, even yeah. down to a one to one thousandth. Yeah. Uh, that small, that's it's small. just, it's, it's, you're, you're not going to get it and you're not going to have your sunflower from that point. Mm -hmm. right. We are actually, if you, if you study anything about, uh, the earth and the sun and all that, we are perfectly placed to have that balance. I mean, there's, I was doing a little study about how cold it is here right now. <laughs> Where's the coldest place on the earth? It's in the Antarctic. It's in the Eastern Antarctic Plateau, minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. But what's the temperature at the equator right now? Much warmer. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. But, uh, you know, people are wearing short sleeves and all that. So how in the world does, we can't replicate that. There's no way. God put us in a perfect spot in this solar system to be for life. And we have the only life around Right. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm from Arizona, so yeah, it's it's pretty nice and warm compared to here right now. So I'm, I'm wishing I was in Arizona. <laughs> the warmest place I've ever been was in uh, Saudi Arabia. It was 135 degrees. Wow. So look at that difference. Over 260 degrees of difference. It's just, it's amazing world. Right. 
So we're right where, right where we need to be. And I think that's also encouraging mm-hmm. for young people who may be listening. Just um, it's easy to wonder, is, my, is God really leading my life? It seems like things are kind of random. I don't know if I'm where I'm supposed to be. Sometimes it's easy to think that maybe you can imagine your future. And then if God doesn't take you on that track, you wonder, is he, he doesn't really know what he's doing, but just let this be an encouragement to you. God has a way better imagination than any of us do. He knows all the details, all the very precise um, things that have to come together to work out exactly what he wants to make of your life story. He's the master designer and the master author. So just let that be an encouragement to you today. And so for the last couple of minutes here, do you have any good resources you'd like to recommend to the audience if they want to learn more about math and Golden Ratio? And Actually, our website is awesome. Uh, we have an awesome website. You go to the answersingenesis.org website, go to the search engine, type in any question that you have like that, and an article is going to pull up that we wrote or one of our colleagues wrote. So that's where I would go. It's yeah. it's just a really Spend awesome. Spend millions of years on our website. Yeah. You know, all the articles. And also come on down to the Ark Encounters, Holistic Creation Museum, and check out Doc, uh, almost a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Criminal Case. Um, uh, awesome discover programs on the Golden Ratio, as well as the, the Ark Encounter one coming up. Yeah. Coming up, hopefully in March. Yeah, stay tuned for that. It'll be well, hope awesome. is not a plan, but, uh, you know, we're, we have a lot of people helping out with that one. With God's uh, grace, we'll, we'll have that up in March. I think it's a discover program of whole water. <laughs> oh, 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 boy. <laughs> Well, thank you for that, and thanks so much for joining us today. And last time, we do encourage you to check out the last episode, too, if you missed that. And we hope you tune in next time as well for more encouraging stories. And meanwhile, please keep standing on the truth of God's Word with zero compromise. See you guys later. God bless.